Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, Your Excellencies, distinguished ministers, distinguished ambassadors, honorable delegates, Director General as Vice President of the 74th World Health Assembly, I'm pleased to welcome all of you to this second extraordinary session of the World Health Assembly. Before moving on to review special procedures and the adoption of the agenda of the extraordinary session of the WHA, I am honored to inform you that several distinguished high-level guests will be present among us. We are very honored to have them with us. Without further ado, I'd like to invite His Excellency Mr. Kasim Jomar Tokayev, President of the Republic of to take the floor. Gabriel Jesus, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to join you all for the opening of this special session of the World Health Assembly. This is only the second such special session in the history of the WHO, a fact that reflects the critical importance of the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. WHO has played a leading role in this unprecedented global public health struggle. All member states of the WHO and their health systems have and continue to exp experience severe shocks as new and dangerous variants of coronavirus that start spreading fast worldwide, the COVID-19 cases are expected to rise in the weeks ahead. The, Omer, the Omicron version recently identified by South African researchers now poses a new threat. Unfortunately, the corona saga has highlighted many shortcomings in international cooperation. The socio-economic consequences of the crisis have also forced a profound rethinking of the social fabric at all levels. The pandemic has confirmed that a new global approach based on solidarity and a more effective system for confronting biological challenges is needed. Dear colleagues, today, first and foremost, we need to close the gaps that made us vulnerable to the virus in the first place. That's why we are gathered in this special session for the sole purpose of considering the need and means to develop a WHO convention or international instrument on pandemic preparedness and response.
Vaccine coverage, which stands at over 40% globally, falls under 3% in some countries. And with around 1 billion idle doses in other nations, millions of avoidable deaths are likely to occur. We can solve this challenge and others if only we muster the political will to once again look outwards. It is our hope that the nations of the world will join forces and heed the lessons of this crisis in pursuit of a united front that serves the moral imperative of protecting present and future generations from the scourge of pandemics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. I have the pleasure now of inviting His Excellency Mr. Lionel Ruin Benjimea, President of the Republic of Nauru, to give us his observations. President of the World Health Assembly, Director General of the World Health Organization, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, warm greetings from Nauru. I am honored to have been invited to make an opening statement at this special session convened to discuss and assess the benefits of developing a World Health Organization Convention Agreement or other international instrument on pandemic preparedness and response. Mr. Vice President, by God's grace, Nuru remain, remains COVID-free today. We have been very fortunate to receive vaccines for the COVAX facility and through our key development partners. However, much of the developing world remains without adequate supplies. And two years after the onset of the pandemic, continue to fight the spread of COVID-19. Our prayers and thoughts are with those who have lost loved ones to the pandemic. In March 2020, the government of the Republic of Nauru instigated a whole of government approach to address, capture, contain and mitigate the risk of pandemic to our island. This approach was and continues to be coordinated by a national task force on COVID-19, mandated by government to determine, implement and regulate, including stringent border security and health security measures Government's quick and sustained actions could not have been possible without the support provided by our partners. Fostering intersectoral and intergovernmental cooperation and collaboration is essential if we are to successfully institute a global response and preparedness to COVID-19 and future pandemics. It is therefore imperative that an intergovernmental process, if it were to be established, be diverse and inclusive, ensuring that all stakeholders, not only member countries, are engaged. Continuing to omit countries like the Republic of China, Taiwan, creates a gap that undermines global preparedness and response to health emergencies. I urge that we learn from the experience of this pandemic, honour the lives of those lost, and develop and establish an inclusive process to collectively and globally be better prepared to effectively respond to future pandemics and health emergencies. Mr. Vice President, the Republic of Nauru acknowledges the work done by the Working Group on strengthening WHO preparedness and response to health emergencies. Nauru agrees with the general consensus that several key aspects of health emergency preparedness and response may not be addressed solely within the scope of the International Health Regulations 2005 and may be best to address independently either through a potential new instrument or through other normative policy or programmatic tool available through WHO. There is a need for clarity on the way forward with an early decision to whether to strengthen the international health regulations and or to develop a new instrument on health security and pandemic preparedness and response. Due consideration needs to be given to what is currently a global issue of inequitable access to vaccines, diagnostic tools, personal protective equipment, medical consumables and essential drugs, including new approved drug regimes. The need for sharing data and lesson learning has taken on an increased urgency in this pandemic as it can literally mean life or death to our people. As this pandemic unfolds, it is clear that no one is safe until we are all safe. The Republic of Nauru, like so many of the small island developing, struggle to sustain this health system under normal times. Given the increasing burden of communicable and non-communicable diseases, therefore enhancing surge capacity needs to be considered on both a country and regional level. The Republic of Nauru supports the call for sustainable financing of the World Health Organization and the potential benefits it would bring. However, in embracing a one health approach, we need to recognize health as an economic good and therefore need stronger engagement with international financial institutions, private enterprises and developed economies. Nauru supports all efforts for strengthening global health governance and takes this opportunity to request that future governance arrangements support include WHO regions to ensure inclu inclusive dialogue of all stakeholders, particularly across Pacific Island countries. 
We further note that there is an immediate need to ensure that the special interests of island nations are adequately considered, particularly to ensure equity access to low middle income member states. Mr. Vice President, leaving no one behind is a global responsibility. Only through unity and inclusiveness can the global community triumph over this pandemic and future health emergencies, ensuring that no one is indeed left behind. Dubakar, I thank you. Merci, thank you, Mr. President. I have the pleasure now of inviting His Excellency, Mr. Charles Michel, President of the European Council, to address the Assembly. Thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, first, I'd like to congratulate you for your courage and for your ambition in organizing this special session of the World Health Assembly. This is only the certain time in the history of the World Health Organization that an extraordinary session takes place. Dear friends, today, I hope we'll make history. The situation in the world demands it. As we speak, the world faces yet another wave of COVID-19, a clear reminder of our duty to our citizens and to each other. Our collective responsibility to never let another pandemic find us unprepared, uncoordinated, or working in isolation from one another. The outcome of this session and your decisions today are vital to how we will cooperate in the future, how we will prevent, prepare for, detect, and respond to health threats in the future. As you know, I've been a strong advocate for an international treaty or legally binding instrument on pandemic preparedness. We need an incremental change in our global health architecture. I want to warmly and sincerely thank you, Dr. Tedros, for our excellent cooperation and the many leaders and countries that have joined us. All of us, political leaders and leaders of international organizations, must be at the forefront of these global efforts. We must show the world that we can cooperate, build bridges, and find joint solutions. There is no silver bullet, no single way out, and there are no easy solutions in managing the massive challenges of global health threats. But we have already shown that when we do work together, human ingenuity knows no bounds. Developing vaccines in just 10 months is a perfect example, nothing short of a miracle. And now it's time for you, the World Health Assembly, to provide the legal framework for these sustainable solutions. We must guarantee that if another pandemic strikes, we have the vaccines we need along with all other countermeasures. And just as crucially, we must ensure equitable access to these countermeasures. We simply cannot allow the same inequality we have seen and continue to see to repeat itself in future pandemics. That's why we must act One Health. We have a unique opportunity to go to the heart of prevention, and I'm referring to One Health. This is not just a concept. We must translate it into concrete action and tangible instruments. Scientists expect that 70% of future pandemics will stem from zoonotic diseases. So we must better understand the links between human, animal, and environmental health. The One Health approach is not a luxury, it's a must-have for future global health. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, thank you again for your dedication.
or to give boosters to healthy adults, just one in four health workers in Africa has been vaccinated. This is unacceptable. With emerging evidence of some waning vaccine immunity against infection, it's clear that in future countries will need tailored booster strategies. WHO's position remains that health workers, older people, and other at-risk groups must be vaccinated first in all countries before those at low risk of serious disease and before boosters are given to already vaccinated healthy adults. There is no doubt that vaccines have saved many lives and helped to quell the pandemic in many countries. Countries that have achieved the highest vaccination rates are now seeing a decoupling between cases and deaths. But in too many countries and communities, the bright light of vaccines has also become a blind, blinding light to the continued need for other tools to stop this virus spreading, to stop it overwhelming our health systems, and to stop it killing. Vaccines save lives, but they do not fully prevent infection or transmission. Until we reach high levels of vaccination in every country, suppressing transmission remains essential. We don't mean lockdowns, which are a last resort in the most extreme circumstances. We mean a tailored and comprehensive package of measures that strike a balance between protecting the rights, freedoms, and livelihoods of individuals while protecting the health and safety of the most vulnerable members of communities. Ending this pandemic is not about vaccines or. It's about vaccines and. Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, COVID-19 has now killed more than 5 million people. And they're just the reported deaths. The excess deaths caused by the virus and by disruption to essential health services are far higher. An unknown number live with post-COVID condition or long COVID, a condition we're only beginning to understand. Health systems continue to be overwhelmed. Millions have missed out on essential life-saving health services for non-communicable diseases and mental health. Progress against HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, and many other diseases has stalled or gone backwards. Millions of children have missed out on vaccinations for other life-threatening diseases and months of education. Millions of people have lost their jobs or been plunged into poverty. The global economy is still clawing its way out of recession. Political divisions have deepened nationally and globally. Inequalities have widened. Science has been undermined. Misinformation has abounded. And it will all happen again unless you, the nations of the world, can come together to say with one voice, never again. At its heart, the pandemic is a crisis of solidarity and sharing. The lack of sharing of information and data by many countries in the early days of the pandemic hindered our collective ability to get a clear picture of its profile and trajectory. The lack of sharing of biological samples hindered our collective ability to understand how the virus was evolving. The lack of sharing of PPE, tests, vaccines, technology, know-how, intellectual property, and other tools hindered our collective ability to prevent infections and save lives. 
and the lack of a consistent and coherent global approach has resulted in a splintered and disjointed response, breeding misunderstanding, misinformation, and mistrust. The fabric of multilateralism has been frayed. COVID-19 has exposed and exacerbated fundamental weaknesses in the global architecture for pandemic preparedness and response. Complex and fragmented governance, inadequate financing, and insufficient systems and tools, voluntary mechanisms have not solved these challenges. The best way we can address them is with a legally binding agreement between nations an accord forged from the recognition that we have no future but a common future. Nations coming together to find common ground is the only way to make sustainable progress against common threats. It's not perfect and it's not a panacea. It takes compromise. No one gets everything they want but that's better than so many missing out on what they need. In 2005, the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control came into force, the first international treaty negotiated under the World Health Organization. An independent impact assessment of the FCTC, the convention in 2016 found it found it has contributed to significant and rapid progress in protecting people from exposure to tobacco smoke. In regulating the packaging and labeling of tobacco products, in education, communication, training, and public awareness, in banning sales to and by minors, and in reporting and exchange of information. The WHO FCTC is the legal bedrock of tobacco control, which countries have used to implement new measures and to defend those measures from legal challenges. The bottom line, the implementation of the FCTC has helped to save more than 37 million lives and counting, and global prevalence of tobacco use has declined from almost 33% in 2000 to 22 percent today. The impact assessment found that without the FCTC, it's unlikely that all these tobacco control measures would have taken place in such a comprehensive, coordinated, and effective manner. So, comprehensive, coordinated, effective. Three words that history will not use to describe the global res response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, if countries can unite to negotiate a treaty against the human-made threat of tobacco, against the destructive potential of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, against the existential threat of climate change, and against so many other threats to our shared security and well-being, then surely, very surely, the time has come for countries to agree on a common binding approach to a common threat that we cannot fully control nor prevent. A threat that comes from our relationship with nature itself. I thank and congr congratulate all member states for the spirit of solidarity and the inclusive process that has resulted in the agreed text of the decision that's before you at this assembly. I thank Indonesia and the United States of America for their leadership of the working group on strengthening WHO preparedness, as well as the other members of the Bureau, Botswana, France, Iraq, and Singapore. I also thank Australia and Chile for their leadership in developing the decision that you will consider at this assembly. And I thank the President, President Charles Michel of European Council